Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by Allstate Insurance, Jared Mayo of Martin, Tennessee. Thank you, Zach, and welcome everybody to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Zach, what is something you discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? This week, I discovered the Rosetta Stone that we have in the Enlightenment Gallery. It is an exact replica. It's a replica of a mode from the exact one in the British Museum. But a funny story about it I learned from Jennifer Wilds, our exhibit director, is that someone important also requested one, but was told they had to wait until Discovery Park of American Union City got there. who was that someone? That person was the Pope. About that. (laughs) Absolutely. So we and the Pope was right after us. So we're excited to have that. And that is a very appropriate um, thing for you have discovered this week since our very special guest is Jenny Gillahan, the executive director with Obion River Regional Library. Is that your title? Is that the title you go by, executive director? It's regional director. Regional director. Excellent. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here today. So Jenny's also very uh, involved in Discovery Park of America and our mission, and we're going to talk a little bit about her and then also a little bit about the library and also the state library and, and archives, which uh, she's part of. Um, so Jenny, back us all the way up. I know Dallas is in your um, history, like Fort Worth is in mine. So tell us all about little Jenny and and how you got started. So I did grow up in a suburb of Dallas, Texas, um, and I, I it was it was an amazing place to be. I miss it every single day. Um, but my my grandfather, tried and true Texan that he was, said if I was going to live in any other state that it was not Texas, that he would approve of Tennessee mm-hmm. because of the history of Tennessee and Texas, of course, stemming from the Alamo and Davy Crockett and all that stuff. Um, so I, I did grow up in Texas, but I grew up in Texas with an appreciation for the volunteer state. Absolutely. Um, so I, my, my undergrad degree is in early childhood education. I grew up going to libraries. My mother is a professional storyteller. So I would tag along with mom and go to these libraries and she'd be telling these stories and her stories are amazing, but I've heard them a lot. So Mm -hmm. I would go and duck into the book stacks and find books and I would be reading while she was there. Um, and somehow, even doing that my whole upbringing, I, it never occurred to me to be a librarian. Um, I thought I was going to be a teacher. I love kids. I love books. I love teaching. So I got my degree in that. Fast forward a little bit. I moved to Tennessee, and I got a job at O'Brien County Public Library right there in Union City um, as the children's department coordinator, the children's librarian there. And it was like the aha moment, right? Everything, everything, all all the lights were shining. It was like, why have I not been doing this this whole time? And I was in my mid thirties when I got that job, Um, but I was just so grateful. And it's funny because I talked to a lot of people who are in libraries and it's like, we all kind of have that aha moment where we realize, oh wait, this is it. This is where I'm supposed to be. So that's where I got my library start was at O'Brien County Public Library. And then I sort of moved along, and now I'm the regional director here at O'Brien River Regional Library. So I'm very fascinated by your mother's uh, career. Was it a career? Was it a yeah. hobby? What you know? What yeah. what is a professional storyteller? So so her day job was that she was a Spanish teacher, um, and then she she's always been a storyteller, or my, as my grandfather said, a professional liar. <laughs> um, that's, that's been, um, her, her hobby. It started as a hobby and then she started, um, she's so good at it that she started being able to book these, uh, these storytelling gigs and libraries and schools and things like that, uh, and started making money at it. And so she's kind of done both, but in, in Texas, in our, in our little corner of the world, she's just a little bit famous. Um, she gets recognized and stuff and she, she appeared on, uh, the TV show Barney and Friends in the 90s as, as a storyteller. Um, so a lot of times when I was in like high school and college, we'd be out somewhere and she'd get recognized. And so that was kind of fun. Now, what is her name so we can Google her? Her name is Mary Ann Blue. Okay. I'm, I'm looking that up because I'm fascinated yeah, by uh, that. She's, but pretty, I'm, she's pretty spectacular. I'm curious. It's, it's 
not too far away from a storyteller to a minister. And I grew up with a minister when she started opening her mouth and telling a story, you know, did young teenage Jenny go, Oh Lord, not again. Oh yeah. That's why I was hiding in, in the book stacks, <laughs> reading books instead. Um, yeah. There's, there's, there's a little bit of that. Um, and you know, now as an adult, I appreciate it more, but, uh, I could also probably tell you those same stories word for word because I heard them so many times. <laughs> have you recorded? Have you recorded them all so you have them? So she she's recorded some, like she's got recordings, she's got albums or whatever. Um, but but I I went through this phase where I really wanted homemade gifts for my kids, and so I had her record even just reading some books um, on a on a tape a tape player and a cassette tape. Um, so that I would have her voice, you know, reading those books to my kids forever. Has she ever been on StoryCorps? The, uh, I have no idea. Yeah, she should. Record yeah, she, she might. StoryCorps. Yeah, she might have. Yeah. That, that's fascinating. So uh, you, you were uh, trying, you know, you're a high school student. You were trying to decide what to major in. What, what uh, caused you to pick the college you picked and where did you end up going? So I ended up at University of North Texas, which is in Denton, Texas. Denton is sort of halfway between Dallas and Fort, Fort Worth, but above it. So they call it the Golden Triangle. You've got Dallas and Fort Worth, and then above that is is Denton. Um, and I went to I went to UNT because they they were the only ones in our area that were doing play therapy, and that's where you get you get young children and you you get them to through through play to work out whatever it is that's troubling them. And I thought that's what I wanted to go into at that time. So that's why I picked University of North Texas. Um, it's also just a spectacular school, um, especially for education. So I ended up not doing play therapy, but I did do early childhood education. Um, graduated from there in the late 90s, started teaching first grade, did that for a few years before moving up here. And I, I thought I was supposed to be a teacher because pretty much everybody in my family are teachers. It's it's just a family full of teachers. So I was like, what, well, that's what did I'm your dad doing. do? Also, also a teacher. Yeah. So and, and, and aunts and cousins and, and everybody. So it just it just sort of that that became, you know, that became what I wanted to do or what I thought I wanted to do. I love kids. I worked with kids. I worked at a day camp every summer with kids. Um, and I knew that I knew that I loved that. I thought that it was just little kids that I loved. I didn't I didn't care for secondary education until I worked at the library and all these teenagers were there. And um, I found that if you treat a teenager like a little kid, they love you just as much. You give them a lollipop. They're going to love you, too. Um, so I, I love that was my favorite thing about working at the library in the children's department is I had infants all the way up through 12th graders. Now, was, Zach. Do your kids like to read? Well, they like for me to read to them. Oh, how old are they? Four and two. Four and two. Okay, that's right. Uh, God, perfect. Perfect. So Zach reads to them. Um, Good. What are, your tips, I'm happy to hear that, Zach. what are your tips for folks like Zach? My girls are my girls are you know older. What are your tips for folks like Jack, Zach to get his kids to love reading? Well, as soon as soon as you can, put a book in their hands. Even, even though even though they can't read yet, put put that book in their hands, and you can get those board books so they can chew on them and and play with them. And it's almost like a toy for them. And and those uh, those board books have have bright pictures and things that draw kids in, and it gets their gets their attention. So even before they know what reading is, they're looking at it, they're they're feeling it. It's textile. Um, they're they're getting that book in their hands and they're getting a feel for it. And this is this is mine, and I enjoy this. Um, and then you, and then you, it's never too early to start reading to them. So Zach, I'm really happy to hear that, but, um, start it, start it as a routine, um, especially at bedtime when they want, when they're, they're sleepy and they want to get in your lap and they want to cuddle. That's when you should be reading to them. Less of the screen time, more of the, more of the page time. Zach, what's their favorite book for you to read over and over again? Uh, well, my son, there's a, we have a cow book that makes noises too. So I hope, I hope that's okay. But yeah, know, absolutely. That, that's what I'm saying. Get them, <laughs> get them involved in it. They, they love a good noise. Yeah. He asks for that book every night. But. Yeah. He probably says the noise with the cow and mm -hmm. hopefully you are too. Oh, yeah. Right? So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Jenny, you have two kids. Is that right? I do. Yes. And I they're do. both, they're both one's in college <laughs> and one's in New York. I understand. Yes. Yeah. My oldest moved to New York recently to pursue filmmaking. And then uh, my youngest is at MTSU, a junior this year. So what do you remember what their favorite book was when you, when you were reading to them? 
Um, so many, so many. Um, a lot of our, our books, when they were really little, came uh, through the mail. Imagination Library, of course, the, the Dolly Parton sponsored um, Imagination Library. Uh, so they, they would get those. And we had we had several that came through that that were their favorites. I remember a lot of the classics that we would have to do every single night. Good Night Moon. Um, there was one called Good Night Gorilla that came through Imagination Library. Um, and there was one, oh, I can't remember the name of it now. It had a knight and dragons. I think it was Take Care, Good Night with a K, the knight and the dragons. So those were like every single night we had to read those without fail. Um, you know, part of that bedtime routine. And then just one more, just one more book. Oh, yeah. For whatever reason, we somehow got started reading. I had this book like from the 1830s and it was an old vintage book and it was called Lives of the Saints. And, you know, uh, we're not Catholic or anything, but it was just very um, adventurous and violent and, you know, fascinating stories. And my girls loved that book and they kept wanting to go back to it. So we would read that one every night. They still talk about that. Oh, um, that's so you um, graduated from college. What eventually got you from the great state of Texas to northwest Tennessee? So I, I came up here, my, um, my husband at the time was from here, so we moved up here to be near his family. Um, and then I found out very quickly, this is a fantastic place to raise kids. And so um, that's, that's what we, we started doing, raising our family here. And then um, I got, I got that, that job at Obion County Library, and then my career took off here. Um, so with, with the career move and the, and the children, you know, being in Union City Schools and all that stuff, this this quickly became my home as well. I also got involved in um, community theater at that time. So that was another reason to, to stay here. We're going to talk about uh, theater um, in just a second. Um, I notice, I mean, I know you well enough to know that you travel a lot. Uh, I see, you know, your Facebook p pictures and in, in Memphis at the Orpheum and, you know, you and your husband, I know, travel all around. And, you know, what what do you, what role does travel play in your having a home in a rural community um, that maybe doesn't oftentimes have some of the resources like Thai food or, you know, things like that? Right. So growing up in a city, um, when, I, when I first moved up here, there was a, a big culture shock for me. I'm used to being able to drive like 10 minutes in any direction and hit a mall, right? Like an indoor mall with, with you know, big, huge skyscraper kind of malls and all that stuff. And here, obviously, we, we are, our resources are limited. But one of the very best things about where we live is the proximity. So you can, you can drive just a few minutes and hit, and hit other kinds of shopping in other communities. You can drive a couple hours and get to Memphis and all that Memphis can give you. A um, couple, couple more hours, you could get to St. Louis. Um, you can get to Nashville really easily. So because of our location, I feel like it's easy, it's easy to get to all of those places and do all of the, the things that are there you know, that we don't maybe have in our community. But I will say in the 20 plus years that I've lived here, our community has grown so much, um, especially with regard to the arts, which is where my heart is. Um, Discovery Park has played a huge part in that. Um, but there, there are things right here in our backyard that we can do that we didn't used to be able to do. So I love that. I love traveling and exploring, but I also love staying home and, and making use of what we have at home too. We have a TJ Maxx now for anybody I out there listening who doesn't that's, know. That's huge. It's yeah, huge for yeah. us. <laughs> very, very big. So, okay. So let's talk about your uh, work with the library. So a lot of people, and I was talking to someone the other day, um, and they were confused by the name. The name, uh, yes. no one else caught I me. Mean, really, it's Northwest Tennessee, right? It's nine counties. Are those the nine counties of Northwest yes. Tennessee? Yes, it's nine counties and it's Northwest Tennessee. So I don't actually work in a public library. I work in a library center. So it's Obion River Regional Library Center. So um, the name Obion River, all of the regions across the state of Tennessee, there's nine regions. Um, all of our regions have a cluster of counties and they're all named after the river that is in that region. Huh. So ours is Obion River. Just south of us, you have Hatchie River Regional Library. To the east of us, you have Red River Regional Library. So these, these regional libraries are centers that encompass the public libraries 
in that region. So we've got nine counties, 19 libraries. That makes up the Obion River region. What, why, why? Who thought of that? So it actually stems back from the TVA days in the 1930s. So the, they were, you know, they were building dams and doing things like that back in Tennessee in the, in the 30s. The Great Depression was happening um, and that, you know, Tennessee was so spread out at that time. And it was really hard to, for people to get access to books. Um, there were not public libraries like they are now in, in, in every county. So uh, this, uh, this idea came up. I think it started in East Tennessee. You have to fact check me on that one. But uh, the idea came up to have a regional library where there would be books that were brought there. And it was the idea of bringing the books to the people. So you've got all these workers that are working on dams, right, for the Tennessee Valley Authority. So you want to bring books to the workers as, you know, morale and training and that kind of thing. So that's how it started. And then it just kind of developed over the years. It turned into, so I think the first regional library was in the very late 1930s, maybe even 1939. Um, and then from there, it went to setting up these regional library stations. So you would have a post office or a pharmacy or even a funeral home where you would have, you know, a small bookshelf and there would be books that the regional library would bring and leave there. And you could check them out. You could go to your post office and check out these books and bring them back when you're done. And then the regional library bookmobile, um, which would, you know, at the beginning be a horse-drawn cart, right? And then later vans and, and big, you know, what we think of bookmobile being nowadays. But they would bring these books, trade them out. So you could keep checking out different books from a station. And then from there, that became uh, that they would bring books to the public libraries. Now you've got libraries opening in all of the, the towns and the counties and things. And so now we don't have bookmobiles anymore, sadly. I wish we did because what librarian doesn't want to drive around in a bookmobile? My um, grandmother, <laughs> my, my maternal grandmother, who was from Brownsville, Tennessee, would uh -huh. go to the bookmobile every time it was at Mr. Lawrence's store, which was right down the road from their house. And she would always have six or seven books and she would rotate. I mean, she loved the bookmobile. And I yeah. used to go with her and look at books whenever I was there. See, that was the regional library system right there in effect that's perfect I, I love that i love stories like that i love to hear because you know that's as librarians that's what we do we bring in access to information to the people whether that be books or technology or whatever it is we want people to have free access to information that's our goal i think maybe nowadays you know with what we have in our hands this phone a lot of people take for granted the library um when i right. i I do a little bit of research and, and I was just up um, in Memphis and, and one of my friends said, you know, is there ever anybody really in the library anymore? And I said, absolutely. You know, there are rows of computers and there are people that maybe don't have one at their home and they're there doing research or paying their bills or looking for a job or, you know, so that's just one of the things that, that take place in libraries. Of course, me doing research, that's a, another thing that takes place what what are the other uh roles of libraries in 2024 so that that is what i love to talk about the most um so you just mentioned one thing and that's access to technology so they may not have uh, a computer at home so they come to the library they use the computer or they may have their cell phone or other device but they don't actually have wi-fi at their house maybe because they can't afford wi-fi or maybe because they live in a rural area where there is no internet service. Um, so they can come to the library and use free Wi-Fi. Um, all of our libraries provide that. So they can do that. Um, there's also uh, programming and other services. So if you, we talked about story time with your little ones, right? Um, you can also bring your little ones to your local library for a story time. You know, maybe you're, maybe you're just getting used to reading aloud and you're not as comfortable. We'll bring them to story time, let them hear their librarian read aloud. Most of our story times are going to include a craft, a snack, things like that. It's a whole activity. It's a, it's a program. In the summer, we have the summer reading program, which is a nationwide program. And all of our libraries will have events going on uh, to promote reading, to bring them in the door and get the, and get the books in their hands so they can start reading too. Um, there's also classes going on at your library. So, you know, there might be technology classes or other things. Volunteers from the community will come to the library and do a class on sewing or, you know, scrapbooking or something like that. 
So there's there's all kinds of things happening uh, like that in your libraries. And this there's a fantastic trend that's going on right now that I'm loving um, called the Library of Things. So you can go to your library and, you know, we all understand the concept of checking out a book. We've done that our whole lives. But you can go to the library and check check out a thing. So you can go check out a cake pan. Let's say you want to make a cake that's a certain shape, you know, shaped like a dinosaur. And you don't want to go buy your own dinosaur shaped cake pan. So you go to the library, you check out a dinosaur shaped cake pan, you go make your cake, uh, you clean it out real good, and you bring it back to the library when you're done. Um, so libraries are checking out things to people now too. Um, even like power tools and things like that, you can check out at some of your libraries. I know Martin Public Library has musical instruments you can check out. So all, all of that stuff is happening. It's all, it's all different. It's, the library is ever growing and changing um, to, to meet the needs of the community. So I know um, you work with a lot of great librarians in, in all of your libraries, but I have to shout out uh, to Carolina Connor, who is at our O'Brien County Library. She does a great job and is very active in the community. And so shout out to her. Um, Yay. And Carol Carolina that, is, is one of the very best. She is, she just got um, uh, another degree or some. Yeah, yeah, she just completed her her master's in library science, which is the professional degree for for librarians. Yeah, so we're we're so we're so proud. She's she's doing great things. Yeah, she's great great to work with. I know we just had a uh, what was it an anniversary or some celebration I was at at the library and and she was yeah doing twenty great, years I think yeah, yeah she was doing a great years. job so kudos to her. Um, and then um, the other part is research. I know some people like Art Shivers and some of the folks who uh, are into the history of O'Brien County spend a lot of time going through the microfilm, microfiche, whatever the right word is, uh, researching. And, you know, that's another part that is near and dear to my heart that all libraries do is is collect the history um, of the community. I know in Brownsville, where my ancestors are from, there's a huge genealogy library that, you know, volunteers um, are part of. So um, I'm sure you guys at, at all of your libraries have volunteers that get involved and, you know, are helping with things like that. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and and no, none of our libraries are funded well enough to do all the things that they want to do. So they really rely on those volunteers to come in and help them do things. Um, most most libraries have a section for genealogy and historical background. Um, a lot of them, like O'Brien County Library and, and Martin Public Library, will have a Tennessee room, which is dedicated to that. So you can go in there and, and look at the history records and all that stuff. And, you know, a lot of that stuff is digitized. And I know at the Tennessee State Library and Archives, they, they've been really focusing on digitizing everything. Um but some of it's not digitized yet. So if you want to do proper research on the history of, of your town or of your family or something like that, sometimes you really have to go to a library to get all the information that you need. Now, you, um, you, you're, you work up through the state library and archives, correct? That kind of do you work? Yeah, I work. I work for them. So um, the public library system in Tennessee is all um, housed under Secretary of State's office. So Secretary of State Trey Hargett um, is responsible for all of the the public libraries. So the Tennessee State Library and Archives um, is part of that. Our state librarian and archivist Jamie Ritter, who Scott, I know you've you've met Jamie. You know him. Yes, um, so he's he's uh, he answers directly to the secretary of state and then the regional libraries. Like I said, there's nine of us. We are all housed under the state library and archives. And Jamie's all, relatively he's relatively new still. And so it's a uh, fun getting to work with him. He's discovering Tennessee and doing a fantastic job. And if anybody's never been to the state library and archives, it's sort of like, you know, a local library on steroids. There's just, you know, as far as research and, and um, artifacts and archives, and um, there's just so much going on. Um, I, full disclosure, I'm a member of the Friends organization, the Friends of the State Library and Archives, great organization that helps raise money for the library, for the State Library and Archives and, you know, helps sort of guide some of the some of the um, things they acquire 
from the history standpoint. And if anybody's interested in that, you can go to friendsoftsla.org. I had to put in a little a little plug for them. <laughs> um, shout out to them. We're going to take a quick break. When we get back, we're going to talk all about theater. As an all-state rep in Martin, Jared Mayo's knowledge and understanding of the people in this community and surrounding areas help him provide customers with an outstanding level of service. He helps families like yours protect the things that are important, your family, your home, your car, and more. Jared Mayo serves O'Bine, Weekly, and Gibson Counties. Get your quote today at allstate.com slash Jared Mayo. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Our guest today is Jenny Gillahan, and we've been talking libraries and archives, and now we're going to switch gears. We're going to talk about theater. So when did you first uh, get bit by the theater bug, as they say? Um, so part of that growing up with the mother as the, the storyteller, the professional storyteller and stuff, I also grew up in community theater. Um, when I was in junior high and high school, I did theater in school. Uh, you know, it was, it was just part of who I was. That's how I met my best friends of my life, who I'm still best friends with. We've been friends since eighth grade. I love to throw that in there because I think that's kind of rare nowadays. Um, so that, you know, the theater... The theater bug bit me at a very young age, and I've always kind of been involved in it, um, just just on my own. And then when we moved up here, Masquerade Theater was going on, and, and that was actually, honestly, one of the reasons I even agreed to move to Union City, because we went to see The Sound of Music that was being done at that time, and, and I was just like, okay, they have theater. I can live here, you know? Um, so and it's, that, yeah. that is very, that is un, unusual for a rural community to have such an an active uh, theater program. So um, I know that when we were getting ready to move here, Michelle and I also were looking, what kind of culture do they have there? And the theater kind of jumps out at you. So I know there's a lot of people that are working really hard to make sure it's a success. And um, it's also because we've had uh, the historic theater uh, academy here at discovery park that you've been involved in in the past and you just did a theater camp for us uh, this past summer um, i know that there's some impact proven impact on young people from involvement in theater do you want to address that sure i mean it's that's one of the things that so many studies have shown and i wish i had statistics on this because uh, I, I get really fired up about it but the performing arts help children um, in so many areas of their life um, and theater in particular helps with things like being able to think on your feet because um, if you're in if you're in a show and something goes wrong you have to keep going right the show must go on you have to keep going so that helps them to think on their feet it helps them with teamwork and collaboration and you know, the whole idea that if I don't show up, then, the, you know, the entire team is let down. The entire cast is let down if, not, if I'm not there to do my part, to do my job. So it's really, it's really good, at, you know, problem solving and critical thinking and all of those kinds of things. Um, the performing arts help with all of that stuff with kids. I, I also, I mean, I think especially in a rural community, um, you find that the Friday Night Lights is really significant. It's not just a TV show or a movie and that, you know, the folks that are gifted in athletics tend to uh, be out there more. And so I think it's great to have opportunities for folks who maybe, you know, are following a different path and have a different skill set. So that's the other thing I think is really important. I, I agree with that. And, you know, sports in our area is is huge and and rightfully so everything is is great but um they get that they get that team mentality by being involved in sports but you know what if what if there's a kid who who maybe isn't gifted at sports you know maybe maybe they're not as athletic but they're more creative and it gives you know the arts and especially theater in this case gives them the opportunity to get that team mindset somewhere else and to learn those skills somewhere else and give them a place to fit in and belong so my last question is, uh, what is your inspiration? What inspires you um, in your work, in your life, and in everything you're doing? I am inspired by community and people. Um, everything that I do, whether it be the theater stuff that I, that I do in my personal life 
or what I do with libraries for my professional life. Everything that I do um, is, is with the community in mind. Um, I want to come into a place and make it better. Um, I, want to, I want to come into an organization or a community and, and make it better if I can and reach the people that need to be reached. One of the, one of the best things about libraries is that it is for the entire community. Um, we serve everybody regardless of their situation. So, uh, you know, anybody can go into a library without the expectation of having to spend any money and they can get the, the services that they need. And I love that idea. I love the idea that we can, we can serve the community in any way, any way that we can. And that's why I love our partnership with Discovery Park of America, because I think that, you know, our libraries and Discovery Park together are serving the community in such amazing and fantastic ways through all the different things that, that we do with you guys. Agreed 100%. Thank you for all you're doing here in the community. And thank you for being on our podcast. Thank you again so much for having me. Thanks to all you listeners who've joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com.